welcome back. Uh, we were discussing hadron hadron collisions and proton distribution functions too. So let me just review that. For hadron hadron collisions, the theory can be reliable for processes with a single short distance scale, high momentum scale. Uh, there can be two scales that are different, but then there are logarithms in this theory of the ratio of the two scales and you need to sum those. And that's a little harder. So the ones with just one scale, uh, very heavy particles can be produced or high transverse momentum particles produced like jets. And in order to have something reliable, you need an infrared safe observable. So typically that involves jets and the jets have to be suitably defined. And for that kind of cross-section, the cross-section factors as in this example here for uh, Z boson production. So there's a parton distribution function for hadron A, a parton distribution function for hadron B, uh, and a calculated cross-section D sigma hat that uh, is calculated in perturbation theory with some subtractions as we discussed a little bit. And there's always corrections to this of order little m one GV divided by the hard scale in the process. And uh, there was a question I think about part-time distribution functions. I had said that they are determined from data and there's lots of data. Uh, and the question concerned, well, how do we get the gluon distribution? And I don't have the relevant graphs for that. Uh, it, you can figure out which processes most constrain a certain distribution. Say the gluon distribution for mu squared equals 100 GV squared uh, and X equals 0.2. You can see how which of all the processes you use, which ones most constrain that. But I, I don't have the graphs for that. However, uh, it's fairly easy to see that you expect quark distributions to be better constrained than gluon distributions because deep in elastic scattering has got lots of data and it's very precise. Uh, Hera Accelerator did a great job on that. And Deep elastic scattering involves a Z boson or a photon exchange, and those interact with quarks because quarks have the electromagnetic electroweak charge. So that immediately determines with high accuracy the quark distributions. Uh, however, gluons don't have any electric or color or uh, flavor charge. So it doesn't determine those at leading order. What does determine gluon distributions at leading order is either jet production for glue glue scattering is can make jets. So right at leading order, two gluons from two protons can make jets or TT bar production because glue glue can go to TT bar. That's perfectly allowed. But there's, there's more constraints on. For one thing, there's the momentum sum rule that says the integral over x, x times parton distribution function summed over all the flavors, including gluons, equals one. So that constrains uh, quite precisely the first moment x times the gluon distribution integrated over x. And then, the derivative of cross sections with respect to the scale uh, is sensitive to the gluon distribution because the derivative of quark distribution has a piece in it that's gluon distribution times the uh, gluon to quark uh, splitting function. So that way, using that, that first order in alpha strong, you get. Uh, constraints on gluon distributions. And since we know quark distributions very precisely, that helps a lot. So it would be interesting in this uh, school to have some discussion, but I don't have it right at hand about just 
where the best constraint on the gluon distribution comes from. Uh, maybe we can have some discussion of that this evening in the uh, discussion sessions. Okay, I would uh, now like to turn to summing large logarithms. That what happens if there's two scales involved? So if you have an infrared safe process and there's just one scale, the theory is uh, quite simple in principle, the calculations are not so simple. But if there are two hard scales, then things are more complicated. So for instance, you consider uh, Z boson production. So A plus B goes to Z plus anything. Here's the Z boson decaying into muon per se. Uh, that's one scale process. So d sigma dp t dy, uh, if pt is of order mz, that theory is simple. However, if pt of the z boson is much smaller than the mz, then there's two scales involved, the pt and the mz. And I can get pt smaller than mz if I just emit a gluon here from one of the quarks. The, the Z boson will then recoil against that uh, gluon momentum. So if you do that, there's at each order of perturbation theory, alpha s to the n log of mz over pt to the power of two n minus one. So two extra powers for each order of alpha s. And if, lo if that logarithm is big, like one over alpha s, and even the square root of one over alpha s, uh, then you need to sum all of those terms. So I'm not going to try to describe how that's done, but it's a complicated thing. What people do is look at the details of, of QCD theory and figure out where you get the important contributions for small pt. And write differential equations that express how the small PPT distribution depends on scales. So you differentiate with respect to the scales and solving those differential equations helps you to write a formula for the answer. For the PDST distribution, actually, what you first do is you uh, Fourier transform. So instead of PT, you use a conjugate transverse position, usually called B. And then you want uh, sigma B basically as a function of B and it's hard for large Bs, for small B it's uh, simple. And you write, then write differential equations and you solve those. Um, and the current way that most people do to do that is uh, soft collinear effective theory which uh, helps you to organize all kinds of calculations like that. Uh, and just as an example, let's just consider the thrust distribution. So you recall the thrust distribution, the measurement operator you use, which we were calling M, is just a delta function that says that the thrust you measure is a certain function here of thrust for M particles. And that thrust for M particles is the maximum over changing the U, the thrust axis of absolute of PI dot U divided by the sum over the PIs. So you find the thrust axis and then you measure that and you measure the distribution then of thrust. And for two narrow jets, the thrust is very close to one. So you will recall what we found there cross section uh, is alpha s for non-zero for thrust that's not equal to one is alpha s over two pi and well one over one minus thrust and then one over one minus thrust times a log and what you'll find well what you notice right away is that singular for thrust goes to zero and there's logarithms and if you go to higher orders there's two extra logarithms for each power of alpha s So those are the logarithms that you need to sum. And now 
let's just recall that thrust distribution is an infrared safe quantity. However, the scale of infrared safety, the, which is basically the value of splitting PTs that uh, can possibly affect your distribution, that scale is proportional to one minus thrust. It's not just Q squared of the whole process, the electron positron annihilation process. It's one minus T times Q squared. So the scale at which that's infrared safe is smaller and smaller and smaller as one minus T becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And then that means that there's really two scales, this Q squared of F and Q squared, and there's logarithms of that ratio. So you have to sum those. Oops. Okay, so one way that we sum such logarithms is parton showers. And I want to spend uh, really most of the talk here talking about not practically how parton showers are done and how, how you pick random numbers and all of that. That's uh, covered in other lectures, but just some of the ideas behind it, at least as far as I see them. So what I want to outline is some ideas behind the organization of uh, what I may call hardness ordered shower generators. That includes Pythia and Sherpa and a uh, program that Zoltan Munch and I work on uh, called Deductor. Uh, there's another program, Herwig is angle ordered. That's a sensible thing to do, but that's a little more complicated to explain. So I won't try to do that. So let me remind you about uh, the physical basis for part-time showers, at least as I see it. Namely, if there's two partons that are coming out of some interaction and complicated things inside of here, then there's going to be a singularity when P1 and P3 get to be quite collinear, or P3 gets to be soft. So when P1 approaches some number Z times a fixed momentum on shell P13, or and P3 approaches one minus the same Z times P13. So in that limit, that's a collinear limit. Or if Z is zero, it's a soft limit uh, for or if one minus C is zero, let's talk about that. If one minus C is zero, then P3 is going to zero. That's a soft limit. Gluons, there's a singularity for gluons being soft, actually not for quarks being soft. So what kind of graphs are singular in that limit? And the kind of graphs that are singular for an amplitude is when P1 in the final state, P3 in the final state just join up. That's not, not all graphs of that property. Maybe P3 joined up with that one or that one as the first interaction from the outside going in. But for the graphs in which P1 and P3 just joined to make P1 plus P3, there's always a singularity uh, in the scattering amplitude, one over P1 plus P3 quantity squared. And there's spinners in the numerator, which cancel part of the singularity. So just knowing that, that's kind of the start of how you define a uh, parton shower. And it's that basic picture I just remind you is leading to the picture in which uh, events have jets in them. So particles uh, very close in angle to each other and then less close and less close. And uh, sometimes gluons here emitted at a large angle, but very soft. So that whole picture, which is what you see in nature, is simulated by the parton shower generators. And I thought I would just talk a little about how that works. Now, here's my basic picture, at least the way I think about it. What we have is, is, is really factorization. You, talk about the hard part and then the not so hard part and the not so not so hard part. You start at the hardest thing that happens. So I've drawn a 
uh, jet production, really. Here's a cork coming in, and then that cork coming in, they exchange a gluon, and let's say that's a 1 TeV transverse momentum gluon. So enormously hard scattering, and this cork and this anti-cork are going off with very large transverse momentum. So there is a scattering with a scale of 1 TeV in momentum space, or in position space, 1 over 1 TeV. But now, something else can happen at a smaller scale. So this uh, anti-quark coming in here could have emitted a gluon with a transverse momentum scale of say 100 GeV. So if the scale for that next emission is hard, so I can use perturbation theory, but much softer than the scale of the hardest interaction, then it's possible to approximate the anti-quark after the emission as being almost on shell, almost on shell compared to the hard scale, which was one TeV here in the hard scale. So I have an approximation in which I had a less hard emission, uh, but still pretty hard. And then I can have another emission, this one from a final state proton, in which it emits a gluon at a less hard scale, I don't know, 50 GeV, say. And again, uh, since it's hard, but quite a lot less hard than the hardest scale, the intermediate line is almost on shell. So it was a good approximation to treat this line as being on shell with respect to the hardest scale, even though it's actually off shell because it emitted a gluon. And then there can be a next hardest scale, that's this gluon split. And then next hardest scale, of uh, this initial state quark split. So, uh, well, one thing you notice is going along the initial state lines, I'm going backwards in time. People used to find that confusing, but that's the standard way to think about it. And for final state particles, I'm going forward in time, but I'm always going from the hardest scale to the next hardest scale to the next hardest scale. I'm, as I go out, I'm increasing my resolution for soft things. So seeing softer and softer things. And there's the picture in real time. And in, uh, for a picture of a calculation, it looks like this thing on the right. So there's a hard interaction and it involves four partons. Two of them are initial state partons and two are final state partons. But I draw them as just the same as a function of T, where T is the shower time. Uh, it seems a nice name for it. And that would be the logarithm of the scale. So higher shower time means softer and softer scales. So what happens here is there's a hard interaction and then there's four partons. And after a while, going to softer scales, one of the partons split. And between those two scales, nothing happens. So nothing happens is this yellow line. And that really represents an operator in the picture of uh, what you really do inside of your computer or inside of statistical mechanics. Uh, you have an operator that represents the probability for the four partons there not to split between this first time and this next time. And then I have another operator, operator that represents the probability for now these five partons not to split between this shower time and the next shower time where there is a splitting. And it just goes on like that. So here in terms of operators is what's represented here in terms of a space-time picture. So you have a shower algorithm in which the splitting vertices give the probability for a parton to split with a given, given sharing of the mother momentum between the daughters. So at each splitting, one parton takes off a fraction z of the parent momentum, and the other one takes off a fraction one minus z of the parent momentum. Those splitting probabilities that go into those red dots here those are an approximation to the results from QCD Feynman diagrams. And in a practical 
implementation, then this whole thing is uh, generated as a code Markov process in which the probability for something to happen in the next time interval is independent of the whole prior history. It just depends on what state you're at right then. So given the parton configuration at some shower time, say T1 here, you select variables for the next splitting. That would be this splitting, T2. You select the variables for that uh, based on you just generate a random number and then uh, use that to plus the probability distributions that you wanted to generate the next splitting. And you keep on doing that. And I think uh, Stefan Prestel has explained part of that. So here's what it looks like in terms of operators. Uh, U of T is the operator that generates, represents shower evolution from time starting at uh, initial time T prime and going to later time T. Later means uh, softer. And that U is an operator on statistical space. That's a space of probability functions, basically, but with, amp with quantum amplitudes in for color and spin. So it's an operator on a uh, space of functions that represent amplitudes and complex conjugate amplitudes in quantum mechanics. And the derivative of u with respect to t, so that's giving the evolution equation for u, has u times two operators, the difference of two operators. And in the notation that uh, we use, the operator that tells what's the splitting probability is uh, h. So that's supposed to represent interaction Hamiltonian in a quantum mechanics analogy, minus V, which is supposed to represent uh, the free Hamiltonian. And V is the probability not to split, and H is the probability to split. And those are broken, those are each integrals over uh, momentum fraction Z that tells what's the momentum fraction in, uh, in the splitting. And they also have uh, complicated color operators inside of them. Uh, and by the way, this HI is what you generate from real part of Feynman diagrams, real splitting uh, Feynman diagrams. And V is an operator that doesn't change the number of partons or their momenta or their flavors. And it's a probability not to split. So it's the integral of H. However, that's an approximation and you can do better than that approximation, although I'm not gonna quite talk about it. That approximation um, is using unitarity. So it's saying that quantum evolution operator times the adjoint of the quantum evolution operator equals the unit operator. That's what, that's what allows cancellation of infinities from soft emissions and what keeps the pro total probability the same. Okay, so V is actually quite simple in the, at least in the simplest approximation. It, it's just the probability not to split. It's the integral of the probability to split. And what I can make up is this operator n, which is exponential of minus the integral over a virtual time tau, a v of tau. So the probability to split at time tau integrated over momentum fraction z, v is inside of it, an integration over z. And tau is integrated from the first time t prime to the last time t. So integral from t prime to t of the probability to split um, is the total probability to split between those two times. An exponential of minus that is the probability not to split. 
okay? And this whole thing should be time ordered. So the if you expand this up, the lowest, the highest T's go to the left and the lowest T's go to the right. Okay, so that's the no splitting probability. This is called the Sudikoff factor, and that's an important part of all the parton um, shower programs. And it's just derived from H, it's the integral of H. Then the complete shower evolution operator uh, between two times is this thing, no splitting between the two times, plus the integral over intermediate times of the complete shower times HI times the probability not to have split between time T prime, that's the starting time, and the time tau at which there is a split. Uh, so that's maybe somewhat less than obvious. It is, however, more or less copied from the way you do perturbation theory in quantum mechanics. And to see that that's right, you can take this equation and differentiate it with respect to T. And then the deriv derivative of N with respect to T is minus V. And the derivative of, with respect to the T that's at the end point here um, just produces T equals tau. So U of T and tau is one, and that's just H times N. So already I've got uh, H minus V times no splitting, or I can differentiate the U. And if I differentiate the U, I should get the same equation H minus V and put that all together. And you see that with that ansatz, uh, I solve the differential equation U. But this is solved perturbatively in powers of HI. So the first term has one HI, the second term has two HIs and so forth. I just see, keep substituting the U from this equation back in for the U there, and I get more and more HIs. So what does that give me? That same formula uh, in pictures can look like this. So U I represent as a big blob, uh, starting with partons coming in from the, on the right and some number of partons going out on the left more partons. N is these yellow things, the probability not to split between T prime and T. And then what I have is the probability not to split and probability to split and then uh, total splitting operator U again, integrated over the time of that one splitting. So that way, uh, you just represent the same equation. The only thing is here I've represented shower time is going left to right, but in operators, you always write it going right to left. So that's why it's all reversed. So to solve that perturbatively with one splitting, two splitting, three splitting. So the no splitting ones is you start here with a hard interaction I wrote in green and all kinds of splittings. That's the hard interaction plus no splitting, plus the hard interaction, and then no splitting for a while, but then a splitting, and then no splitting for the rest of the time. Or no splitting for a while, no splitting for another while, and then, I'm sorry, splitting, then no splitting for another while, then splitting, et cetera. And finally, I, I've iterated this a couple of times. Finally, I have, three interactions and then the complete operator. So I've, I'm just iterating the uh, equation. And that's a picture of how proton shower algorithm works. It just generates new splittings. So in the end, it looks like this and the shower time is progressing on and you just choose the time for the next splitting according to the probability not to split. And finally, at the end, you've got lots of partons, um, maybe 30 or so, and then you stop it. At some time, the scale has become too small and you're no longer allowed to use perturbation theory, so you just stop the parton shower. 
Uh, I should also mention quantum mechanics in quantum mechanics to get a probability, what we do is we sum amplitudes and then we square. So you need to talk about amplitudes, but if you have one amplitude and another amplitude, you can have the uh, interference between the two. So amplitude A times the complex conjugate of amplitude B. So here's a picture of an amplitude on the left, and here's a picture of a complex conjugate amplitude. And in each of those, uh, an original parton split into partons one and three. So this was parton A coming in, parton and parton B coming in, but it's written going uh, to the right. And then there were two gluons produced and then one of the gluons split. Okay, so that's an amplitude squared. However, there's interference diagrams where gluon number three is emitted from gluon number one and in the complex conjugate amplitude, it's emitted from gluon number two. And you have to include that, otherwise you're not really doing quantum mechanics. So that's included in modern part-time showers, uh, interference diagrams like that in, a, in an approximation, not exactly. Uh, what, what you do is you consider that one and two make a color dipole. And you can include either emission from one or emission from two or the interference between those. And you just add those up. That interference diagram, it, how important it is depends on what gauge you're using. If you use a physical gauge, like uh, A plus equals zero, for instance, or a Coulomb gauge, in a physical gauge, gluons going into the final state are transversely polarized. In a Feynman gauge, unfortunately, uh, calculations are simpler, but there's unphysical polarizations for gluons going into the final state. So conceptually, it's best to think of a physical gauge. And in that case, this first kind of diagram, the direct ones are the most important ones. They have soft singularities and collinear singularities and soft times collinear singularities. And the interference diagrams still are important. Uh, they're important when gluon three is soft, but not when it's collinear. When it's gluon three is collinear to parton one, then it's not collinear to parton two and this propagator is way off shell. As long as I don't consider uh, on physically polarized gluons. In Feynman gauge, it's a little different than these both kinds of diagrams have both kinds of singularities. Okay, so you may hear that a parton shower program is a dipole shower. That's what it means. It means you include the interference diagrams. And uh, you still usually approximate it uh, quite severely with respect to color, but you include basically these diagrams. And there are better ways to do colors also. So now what happens? You apply uh, this operator many times. Finally, you've produced 30 uh, partons, let us say. Uh, but then your parton shower is instructed to stop. As soon as it gets to too small a scale of order one GV, it's just supposed to stop itself because you can't trust perturbation theory. So you turn the parton shower off, but you haven't reached the end. So Pythia, Sherpa, Herwig provide a non-perturbative model of how to make hadrons out of all those partons. Uh, so, for instance, for Pythia, what happens is you've got a bunch of partons. Uh, you've simplified the color quite a lot, uh, but you've still kept track of color. So each of your partons carrying color is connected to other partons uh, 
by color strings, or you may, may have, their color is such that a color string could connect them. And a quark is connected to other partons by one color string. And a gluon is connected to two partons by two color strings. So if you had a quark, anti-quark gluon state, the quark is connected to the gluon usually, and then the gluon is also connected to the anti-quark. Uh, and that's actually the only way it could be. But if you have quark, anti-quark, gluon, gluon, you could have the quark, anti the quark connected to the anti-quark with one color string, and it could turn out that the gluon is connected to the other gluon by two strings. That's color possible. Uh, it won't occur in Pythia, but it could happen. Uh, so anyway, you keep track of the color in your splittings by saying that whenever a quark emits a gluon, then it is color connected to the gluon. And the other color connection of the gluon goes to whatever the original quark was color connected to. So you just generate the color connections that way. And then you say that the quarks and gluons are all connected to each other by strings. And then there is a model which dates from the 1980s called the Lund string model, in which strings break up into pions, nucleons, and so forth. Particularly, a string can break eventually. Uh, you just consider that it breaks. So if you had a string connected to a quark and then it breaks and then at the break, you make a quark and an anti-quark, then you have a quark and anti-quark and that's a pion or maybe a rho meson. So there's a nice model of how that all works built into Pythia. Uh, and Sherpa uses a somewhat different model in which you consider the color singlet combinations form hadrons uh, according to probabilities. In any case, the model has lots of parameters in it, which you can adjust to fit data. So that part of the model is uh, fit to data. So I can review that. And that's the end. We're going to have some time for questions. Uh, parton showers are based on lowest order perturbation theory. So they're not as precise as next leading order or next to next leading order calculations. Although in some sense you can match them. Uh, and in favorable cases, the parton showers can some large logarithms. So for instance, a parton shower, if you run it to produce the thrust distribution, will do a good job of summing logarithms of that up to some accuracy, which is pretty good. And the real advantage of parton showers is that they produce whole events in some approximation. So instead of saying uh, in a calculation, you have a cross section to reduce the Z boson and a jet inclusive over everything. So we don't, everything else except Z boson and jet is, uh, you don't say what you're producing. Uh, That'll produce, that's has the theory well under control. However, it doesn't tell you what particles are coming out of those events, what they look like in detail. So it's a little hard to uh, interface that with actual detector results. You have to first take the detector results and turn it into run a jet algorithm on it to produce the. Uh, Cross section that you wanted from data. But it's nice in order to check how your uh, theory is working compared to the experimental results. It's nice to see what the detector, or rather, what a mathematical model of the detector does to real events that made of protons and antiprotons and pions and things. And for that, you should take a Barton Char Monte Carlo and run it to produce whole events and then see what the model detector does to the whole events. So the parton showers are really important. And of course, a lot of the school is, going to, is about that. And it's 
So there's two reasons for it. Uh, part-time shower is important. One, they produce whole events, and two, they can hit uh, some, in some approximation, large logarithms. Okay, that is it. We have uh, plenty of time for questions. And I think there was one question about um, multiple part-time scattering, is that right? So maybe I should address that. Uh, and for that purpose, let me just stop my screen sharing and then share a different uh, window. And where's my window? This one. Share. Okay, so you should see a sort of a blank piece of graph paper there. And I believe I can write on that, yes. So Pythia has, and other programs, but I think particularly Pythia is especially good at it, at talking about multiple parton scatterings. So, you can have a hadron coming in and another hadron. And they have a bunch of quarks in them, quarks and gluons. And then there can be a scattering. That's the hard scattering that you start with. But now my quark can emit a gluon, and that's the start of your ordinary uh, parton shower. So now there's quark and a quark and a gluon in the final state. And of course, I should uh, square sum a bunch of things like that and square them. But I can also have, as my next step, an emission of a gluon from a spectator quark. And Pythia does that. So now you may ask, what does that have to do with QCD? And uh, the answer to that is, is uh, rather interesting, I think. Mostly the KT of that gluon is much smaller. Uh, KT squared is much smaller than Q squared, which was this hard scale of the hardest scattering. So why is that? Why don't we have other emissions that produce high, high KT uh, reactions? And the way to understand that is to, a way to understand it, is to consider a picture of a proton there's a picture of a proton. So the inside of it's the proton. And this is a proton that's coming at you. So X and Y are the axes. The proton's moving in the Z direction. And let's suppose that this quark right here was at this transverse position. Now, uh, maybe I could change my color. I want to have an anti-quark coming from the other hadron, and it's got to interact at a short distance scale with respect to the first quark. So where is it gonna be? The short distance scale has say this size. That size there is one over Q. So the other, the quark from the other hadron has to be within that area. But what's the chance that it's within that area? The probability for it to be in that area is one over Q squared to make an area times uh, the radius of the proton squared, one divided by radius of the proton squared. So that's one over Q squared 
times r squared. Okay, so what is that telling me? That tells me that the probability for, the, for a hard scattering is small. It's one over q squared. Um, the cross section is just one over q squared. It's got dimensions of area, so you should cross section divided by the area of a proton is one over q squared r squared. Well, that's right. You know that cross sections to make jets or C bosons or whatever are enormously small compared to the total cross section for proton proton scatterings. It's way smaller. And what is smaller by is one over q squared. Okay, that's fine. But now, how about the probability to have a second scattering with a second quark coming from here, uh, making something with large transverse momentum. So if I here I emitted KT, and this is recoiling with minus KT, so if I take a square of that diagram, it says there's another hard scattering here if KT is big. So the chance to get another hard scattering is the first parton um, has to be somewhere and that the chance to have another hard scattering is one over KT squared R squared. So if KT is of order R, then that's just one. There's probability one to have extra stuff scattered out with one GV of transverse momentum. But probability that's really small to have extra stuff scattered out with very large transverse momentum. So that's telling you that if you want to really create the final state, you want to include small transverse momentum particles, then you should have this kind of emission where you produce a whole lot of transverse momentum particles, but with low transverse momentum, coming from just splittings of all the spectator quarks all over the place. And that can be built in to a probabilistic parton char Monte Carlo. You just, when you go down and down and down in transverse momentum space, uh, you start generating more and more of these things. So that'll help produce a whole event. But it doesn't change the, probability to have uh, large transverse momentum particles, uh, two of them produced by having two separate scatterings. That is a power suppressed uh, correction and it's power suppressed by this power. So remember in the parton uh, factorization formula, what we had was F parton A, and f for parton b and d sigma hat dy say okay so that's the hard scattering cross section sigma hat but there's corrections plus order some low scale m squared or inverse r squared over q squared and those corrections right there are represented uh, one way you get them is this double parton scattering. And finally, if you want to see in Feynman diagrams, what can happen, let me make a Z boson here and an anti-Z boson, or an, from a quark and an anti-quark like that. And now let me have inside of my Hadron, a gluon emitted. So that's just part of the parton distribution function, but that let that gluon couple up to the quark. So now I have a cross section which seems legitimate to have an anti-quark and a gluon plus a quark, Q bar Q gluon coming in, goes to a Z boson. So why don't I include that? It's similar to the discussion we just had, but looked at in terms of Feynman diagrams. And the reason that that is not included in the factorized formula is that right here, that 
uh, propagator is going to be off shell by one over Q squared. So the whole thing is uh, suppressed by one over Q squared, as long as this gluon is, has a large momentum in the direction of hadron B. Okay, so that's my take on double parton scattering. We can just we can discuss uh, that some more if we need to. Uh, but I would uh, be happy to take any kind of questions that there might be. Uh, so, are there any questions? Yes, uh, I don't see who this is. Uh, Andrew, I guess I'm the other one. Andrew. Andrew, yes, hi. <laughs> Talk. Um, yeah, thanks for the, for the lectures. So yesterday and a bit today, actually, as well, you mentioned this uh, sort of degree of, um, of infrared safety. And I'm not sure I fully understood it because I can, because um, for example, with thrust, you have that uh, it, it is infrared safe, right? And so I can it's infrared imagine safe, yes. Your sort of degree of infrared safety should go to some zero or one, or you know, so, so something which tells me that that is infrared safe for any variable. Whereas so something that's not infrared safe should be something, say, non-zero. Um, uh, doesn't have to be zero, but sort of something non-pathological. If that makes sense. So I'm, I'm not really sure I understand exactly what this Q squared of f is is telling me, or, or how I should uh, how I should imagine sure. that. Now, let me just uh, say that again. I think it's a good way to, th to think about uh, physics and infrared safety. So I wanted to measure an observable that I just labeled by F. Mm -hmm. And F could be the thrust distribution. Yep. So in that case, F is a delta function of the thrust that you want to measure minus which I call calligraphic T, which is depending on all the parton momenta. When you put it into the formula, that's what it is. Okay, okay. so then Q squared for that F, for the thrust distribution, wow, well, what was that equal to? It was one minus thrust. I think one minus thrust divided by the thrust times uh, Q squared of all yeah. process. Yeah. Okay, so infrared safe means Q squared of F is less than infinity, it's some number given the value of T. If it were not in something that's not infrared safe as Q squared of F, uh, sensitive to scales of any any size. I'm sorry, this is backwards. Let me erase that. Q squared of F is bigger than zero. So when the Q squared of F is zero, that means you're sensitive to any scales down to one GV, down to one electron volt, the whole thing is just uncalculable. Mm -hmm. However, here Q squared of F is uh, Q squared times one minus T. So it's positive, uh, but it's uh, could be a lot smaller than Q squared. And for a practical calculation, which you really need, is Q squared of F should be bigger than, maybe a lot bigger, maybe 10 GeV squared. So if Q squared of F is bigger than 10 GeV squared, you can use perturbation theory because alpha strong of 10 GeV is uh, still pretty small compared to one. So you're still allowed to use perturbation theory as long as you're infrared safe in the sense that your Q squared is bigger than 10 GV squared. 
However, you're going to have problems because there's a log of q squared divided by q squared of f at each order of perturbation theory, log squared alpha strong is summed. So you better sum all those uh, important logarithms in order to have a reliable prediction. But it's still infrared safe because you can still use perturbation theory as long as q squared of f is bigger than zero or in practical, practically bigger than a few GeV squared. Okay, so if I understand correctly, you can basically, so, so the higher, higher Q, sort of higher lower bound on Q squared of f, the less infrared safe you are because you can't uh, use perturbation right. theory down to the, you can only use sort of perturbation theory down to that level, uh, if I understand correctly, right? Yeah, right. So you're, as Q squared of f is smaller and smaller, you're less and less safe. And as soon as Q squared of f is a lot smaller than the biggest Q squared, you'd better be summing logarithms. Otherwise, uh, you're not doing a good job. Okay. But you're totally out of luck if Q squared of f is two electron volts. Mm -hmm. So then you got huge logarithms. In okay. Then, well, not only use logarithms, then alpha your alpha strong of that value is uh, oh, true. Yes, yes. just out of control. Yep. So you could still run Pythia to try to get a prediction, but your prediction from Pythia is then sensitive to all of those parameters that go into adjusting the string fragmentation of Pythia, which is fairly accurate, but it's not derived from theory. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, great. We could do one more question, I think. Do we have another question? Oh, hi, uh, Ross Hunter. Hello, yeah, Go thanks ahead. very much for the, for the lectures. I wanted to ask a question about uh, rapidity, please. So with pseudo rapidity, there's this exact relation between the, the pseudo rapidity and the, the kind of opening angle. Can we think of rapidity in this similar kind of way? Um, oh, it's got a formula. Don't remember exactly what it is, but so it's eta was one half log of the tangent of the angle at which it makes to the particles going out with respect to the beam mm -hmm. uh, over two. So that's really precise. It just means angle in the detector. So you've got this huge detector. There's my version of Atlas. And there's the center of it. So going out just that way corresponds to a certain value of the eta. Mm -hmm. And it's a logarithmic variable. So uh, eta equals four is a really small angle like that. That's yes. the way in the NCAP calorimeters. So you have a calorimeter that's divided up into little cells um, that are labeled by eta and phi going around this way. So y is approximately eta, but it's got corrections of order the mass of the particle divided by the uh, PT of the particle. And I don't remember the formula for that. It's not a simple formula. Okay, but that's, that's very helpful, thank you. It's good to be able to, to visualize it that way, thank you. Okay, so I'll have fun uh, this evening going around and talking to everybody. I really recommend you come to those rooms because we have really good uh, facilitators in each room. So I'll just see you this evening. Okay. Thank yeah. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you for everyone, and we'll see everyone at twenty hundred uh, on the Gather Town. That so have a good uh, afternoon then. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye.